Uh, so next up is Rajiv Sethi. Uh, his talk is also about forecasting election. The title is Models, Markets, and the Forecasting of Elections. Uh, Rajiv is professor of economics at Barnard College, Columbia University. He's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. He's currently a Joy Foundation Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. And uh, previously, he was a visitor at Microsoft Research New York City, and uh, that's how I got to know Rajiv. He was also a visitor um, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's been um, served on the editorial boards of American Economic Review and Economics and Philosophy. And um, as I mentioned, that new journal, Collective Intelligence, his current research deals with information and beliefs. So go ahead, Rajiv. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Dave. Um, and actually, uh, Andrew's talk is a nice setup for this one. I, in fact, I think I can tell you uh, what would have happened had he had Andrew bet on, on the basis of his model um, and maybe address also Bo's question about how we might uh, evaluate these models. So what we do here is to take a look at two different approaches to forecasting uh, models and markets. Um, and uh, look at them comparatively and also think about how one might synthesize them to improve on either one. And generally speaking, models are backward looking. They, they're based on a limited set of variables like opinion polls or economic fundamentals, incumbency and so on. Um, and they are just sluggishly to news. So maybe not that sluggishly, but it takes time for news, especially news that isn't directly incorporated into those variables to enter uh, and change those values of those variables. Um, in contrast, markets are fundamentally forward-looking. The traders who buy and sell securities um, can use arbitrary sources of information and they generally have very rapid adjustments. So you have two very different approaches to uh, forecasting. And what we do in this paper is try to look at the comparative uh, performance of these two, although there are issues about uh, uh, evaluation that Bo raised, which we'll address. Uh, and we do it by looking actually at the model that Andrew Gelman referred to uh, with with his colleagues, uh, uh, Merlin Heidemans and Elliot Morris, that was published by The Economist. Um, and we look at the predicted exchange for, for, for the market model. And we focus on 13 battleground states over 216 consecutive days leading up to the election, about seven months starting in April after the COVID effect was pretty much uh, uh, known. Uh, and we conduct a comparative performance evaluation um, with caveats. Uh, we look at the value of integrating these approaches and propose a method of hybridization. Now you can think of two ways in which you could combine models and markets. One, one very simple one, which I think people are pursuing now, is to just take the market prices as an input variable. So you could just have the market prices be one of the variables in your model. And that gives rise to some sort of paradoxical uh, uh, effects because that'll change the model in a way that will feed back into the market because uh, of course the model is public information and traders are gonna base their, their, their behavior based on the model. And so you get a certain feedback loop that, that's potentially interesting. But that's not the, that's not the way we approach it. Uh, we, we try to think about how we can take the, mar uh, take the model and have it participate uh, as a trader in the, in the market, uh, represented by a trading bot that uh, inherits the beliefs of the model and updates the beliefs of the model, um, compares it to market prices, and, and basically tra trades on behalf of the model um, in a way that can be tested experimentally. So you can tune the parameters, the risk aversion, the budget, and so on of the bot, and try to see what can improve uh, model forecasts. Of course, algorithmic trading is a big part of organic uh, uh, financial markets. And you heard a bit about this yesterday in the panel, uh, but this is a, a, a way to systematically insert a model into a market in a way that can be tuned and tested. So um, very quickly, since I, since I don't have a whole lot of time, the list of states, the 13 states we look at are on this slide, they were all considered competitive at one point or another. And there's significant disagreement between the model and market as I'll show you in just a second. Why don't we take the more extreme states? Well, because markets are known to perform poorly when probabilities are close to zero or one uh, for various reasons having to do with liquidity and leverage that, that uh, I won't go into, but really the value of markets arises when there's some genuine uncertainty. And so we're focusing on these states. So the first thing I just want to show you is just the probabilistic forecast. So the, the you know, likelihood of a democratic nominee victory. Um, so these markets were established before the nominees were known. So, so they reference the democratic nominee and the Republican nominee, Biden and Trump effectively. And what you can see is that the model, and this is the economist model that Andrew actually referenced. Uh, the economist model by the end of the day, close to the election had 
extremely high, you know, around 97% chance of Biden winning Michigan, Wisconsin, and, you know, 93, 95% in Nevada, Pennsylvania. I've dropped from this graph a couple of states, uh, Minnesota and New Hampshire, just to avoid clutter, but they would have been up there as well. And you see the range all the way down to Texas. And that's the model forecast on the left. And you can see how they moved over time. The market forecasts are very different. They're much more compressed. They occupy a, a narrower range of probabilities. Um, and you see some really big disagreements, both in levels and in trends. Uh, you see the same thing here. This is sort of the support of the distributions. And you, uh, you see that the model predictions occupied a much broader range of uh, the, the space compared to the, compared to the market predictions, which were more compressed. Um, so how do we evaluate performance? So I'll, you know, we'll come back to Bo's question about, well, can you really evaluate performance um, in a bit? But we look at daily forecasts and you know, P, uh, is, PIT is the probability assigned to uh, a democratic victory in period T. Um, in state I, the, with the forecast that's made in period T and you have 216 periods, consecutive days and 13 states. And, and, and we look at first the time series of the average Breyer score. So the average here is averaging across states. Um, and this is what it looks like. So you see in the first month, the, the model actually does quite poorly compared to the market. So lower scores are, are, are better, of course. And uh, you know, for the first month uh, of, a, of the period we look at, uh, the market outperforms the model quite a bit. And then there's, they're relatively close. And then you get some divergence in the opposite direction towards the end. And, and by the end, the eve of the election, the model is actually doing better than the market. This is just you know, averaging across 13 states daily forecasts, the daily closing price from predicted for each state and the daily uh, forecast from the economist model. And if you just average not only across states, but also across times, so just take the, take the time average bias score for these two methods, uh, there's negligible difference. So these two things basically cancel out and you get, you get uh, um, average bias scores over the entire period of about you know, 0.15. Uh, uh, slightly upwards of that. And just keep these numbers in mind roughly uh, as we compare it to other measures. Now, the first, you know, one way to sort of construct a sort of hybrid, a synthetic forecast is just to take the average, right? You could just take, you know, if the market is saying 60% and the model is saying, you know, 78%, you could just take the average of that. And that's, that's a sort of synthetic forecast. So let's start with that and see how that would have done. Now, in terms of Breyer scores for any state date pair, obviously, the average can't possibly outperform the component forecasts. Uh, the, the performance of the average will be average in a certain sense. Um, and that's true for any given state, uh, state date pair. But if you, if you average across states, or if you average across dates, or both, uh, that need not be the case. The average can actually do better. And that's especially true if the model and the market are making different kinds of errors in different types of states. Um, it's possible that the average, which, which will avoid the most egregious errors, and the Breyer score punishes really big errors, uh, it's possible that the average can actually do better. And in fact, it does. So if I just add to the time series of the Breyer scores, the, the Breyer score of the average. So this just takes for each state, it just averages the, the forecast based on the model and the forecast based on the market and looks at the Breyer score for that average. In the early part of the period, the, the performance of the average is pretty average. You can see it's between the two components uh, averaged across states. And towards the end, actually, for almost the entire last month, the average does better in terms of its uh, forecasting performance. And it's quite a bit better right at the end uh, towards the election eve. And again, if you average across time as well as uh, states, you know, on the last day, November 2nd, at the bottom, you see there, the price score for the market is, is uh, uh, um, you know, the market, the model, and the average. And you can see, you know, they're not huge, but they're quite clear, I think, differences where the average actually beats both components. Uh, and you can see why in this diagram, um, you see really big errors, for example, in Florida and New Hampshire for the model, uh, sorry, in Florida and North Carolina for the model, which predicted quite confidently Biden winning Florida and North Carolina got that wrong. And the market is excessively uncertain. So these compressed uh, forecasts are, are, are giving it very low confidence, even in states like Minnesota and New Hampshire, which, which Biden won easily. And, and, and so the average actually, you know, uh, um, by avoiding the most extreme errors of model and market, and those errors arising in different states at different times uh, actually does pretty well. Okay, now that's a very crude way to construct a hybrid forecast. So can we do better than that? And that's the whole point really of this exercise, to try to construct a, a different way of, con a more sophisticated way of, of constructing a synthetic uh, uh, forecast. Now, as I mentioned, and as was mentioned on the panel yesterday, uh, algorithmic trading is very common in financial markets where low latency can be highly rewarding. 
um, uh, you know, upwards of two thirds of all transactions in stocks, for example, are, are executed by, by bots. Um, and, um, or, or, or are entered, the orders appear as a result of, uh, uh, um, you know, algor algorithmic uh, um, analysis of, of rapidly incoming data. Um, so we follow this, but, but we do it in a way that will allow us to tune parameters and test experimentally. So uh, although I won't report any experiments to you, this is, this is work in progress. So uh, you have to endow this bot with a budget and preferences you know, over um, risk, uh, risk attitudes, because uh, um, it's on the basis of that that it's going to trade. Now, I think Harry is going to talk later about different approaches to try to figure out how to place bets. But the way we do it is, is fairly... Uh, straightforward and standard in economics, at least, which is to uh, to to have preferences over over terminal wealth that reflect your own budget, reflect your beliefs and preferences, whether beliefs are inherited from the model, and you place orders accordingly and you update daily. So that's that's really what this bot is going to do. So just a little bit of notation to tell you what what uh, this this bot will optimize. So suppose that the model generates a distribution of outcomes in M jurisdictions. So in this case, 13 states, N candidates in each. So N in this case is just two in, in the case of the uh, application that I'm discussing. And let S, this is a N by M matrix, uh, M by N matrix be the set of outcome, uh, be the outcome realization where SIJ tells you that candidate I has one jurisdiction J or state J. And the set of all possible outcomes here, you have got two to the 13 outcomes, depending on who wins which state. Um, and, the, and, and the model is generating a probability that, that, uh, uh, that gives you a probability of each one of these roughly 8,000 outcomes. Now, for the economist model, we don't have this data, There's this sort of fine tuned probability, although I'm sure we can get it. Um, but uh, for 538, it's available uh, at least on the last day, it's available online November 2nd, you know, you've got uh, simulations from which you can deduce this full probability distribution of outcomes, or at least approximate. Now the market doesn't give you the possibility to bet on all combinatorial possibilities, at least not these peer-to-peer -peer prediction markets like predicted. What it does is it gives you uh, individual state contracts and you, know, you, can, you can bet on the outcome of these individual states. So it's, so it's um, much simpler in a sense than the outcome space. Uh, and each contract, we're gonna assume uh, that it has a unique price. There's a spread between the bid and the ask prices. If you wanna buy or sell, you're gonna pay, you know, you're gonna pay or receive slightly different prices. Let's ignore that for now. It's discussed in the paper exactly uh, what, what happens. Uh, sometimes the bot will actually place orders. It'll occupy or it'll fill the order book. At other times, it'll take liquidity and trade against existing orders. But I, I won't go into those kind of details right now. Uh, just suppose that there's this unique price at which you can buy and sell securities and let Q, a matrix, again, it's gonna be uh, M by N matrix, denote the prices where QIJ is the price at which you can buy a contract that will pay off if candidate I wins in jurisdiction J or state J. Okay, um, this is the only sort of technical slide in the talk. Um, Dave, can you tell me? I don't see, I pinned you, but I, I don't see how much time I have left. Can you give me a rough idea? Um, about four minutes if you, okay. if you have the five minutes of questions at the end. Okay, so let me, let me try to, like, let me try to uh, move along. Um, so so um, how do we determine the size of the bets? So suppose that the bot at any particular time has a cash position Y and a contract position Z, where Z is a matrix, again, N by N matrix, where, where you, know, you, have a, you, you, know, you can have a contract for candidate I to win in jurisdiction J. Um, and that Z can be positive or negative. You can bet for or against that event to occur, right? So you have a full collection of contracts here for each candidate in each state. And um, you know, what, what will you get from that at the end of the day? Your terminal wealth is gonna be your cash plus whatever payoff you get from your, from your uh, contracts. And so if a state, you know, you know, which will depend of course on the outcome and for each uh, uh, candidate that wins, you'll get a dollar for each of the contracts you have that's positive, you'll lose a dollar for each of the contracts that you have that's negative. Um, so this is very standard. This is gonna be your terminal wealth. What's, we don't assume that you maximize terminal wealth. That would be risk neutrality and risk neutrality for various reasons we want to avoid. Um, so we assume risk aversion. So, so what this bot is going to do is to maximize expected utility based on the beliefs P that I inherited from the model. So, you know, you take the expected value of a utility function. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you which one exactly in a minute. It's going to be the log function. Um, and that's utility of terminal wealth. So the utility of, uh, applied to your cash position at the end plus whatever you get from your contracts, which is, of course, state dependent. 
and it's increasing and concave, which reflects uh, risk aversion. And on any given day, you're going to decide what trades to execute. And uh, your trades are denoted by X. Again, this, this uh, uh, matrix X will tell you what contracts you're going to buy and sell in each market. And that will be such that your adjusted portfolio is going to maximize the function at the bottom of this slide. So you'll maximize the expected value of your utility uh, um, as given at the bottom of this slide. Okay, we implement this and I'm gonna just show you very simple. Suppose that there's only one state, Wisconsin, and then I'll, I'll give you a bit of information about other states. So suppose there's only one state and you use log utility, which is part of this class of functions, the constant relative risk aversion uh, class of functions, uh, which allows you to tune based on this parameter coefficient row. Um, and suppose you have a cash endowment of $1,000. Well, what would the bot do in Wisconsin if it believed the, the economist model? In the beginning, it would bet on Trump. It would bet against Biden. So this is bets for the Democratic nominee to win. Uh, but gradually, it would adjust these bets. And then, you know, your position, this is your Z, it's going up and down uh, based on how different the prices are relative to the model uh, forecast. And you can see that you know, for the last six months, it's going to have a positive uh, bet on Biden in Wisconsin that fluctuates up and down depending on how prices change and how its own uh, forecast change. Um, what I've shown you here, this is not a solution to the full optimization problem that I laid out earlier. This is if you just had a single state. So just doing the Wisconsin exercise for all the other states. So if you just had $1,000, you can think of it as 13 separate bots with their own budgets and preferences if you like. So what's happening across all these states, um, you'll see some of the states are just like, uh, they behave just like Wisconsin. You, you start off betting against Biden, but then you build up a strong position. That's what happens in Minnesota, Michigan, Florida. Then you've got other states like Iowa where you're fluctuating and Texas, which we are fluctuating as well as Ohio. So you get different behavior in different states depending on you know, the nature of disagreement between model and market. Um, I'll finish in about two minutes, Dave. Um, if you just look at what happens in the aggregate, so this is what I said about if Andrew had actually bet based on that model. Um, you know, you've got a thousand in each uh, state, a thousand dollars cash in each state, in states where the model is very confident that cash position is gonna go down. So look, for example, at New Hampshire. Model is very confident Biden's gonna win New Hampshire. So you get a cash position of 72. So $1,000 has gone down to 72 because the rest of the money has been converted into contracts. You've got a lot of contracts, 1,274. Um, all of those pay off because Biden does win uh, New Hampshire. So you get a good healthy return of 35% in New Hampshire. And of course you lose in some states. So you lose in Florida, for example, North Carolina uh, uh, in a big way. Um, you gain in Texas, even though, even though Trump won Texas because the bot is shorting Texas. It's betting, uh, it's betting on Trump actually. You've got a negative position on Biden in Texas, so it makes money in Texas even though Biden lost. Overall return is 16%, a double digit return, uh, makes about $2,000 on $13,000 of capital. Uh, we're not taking into account fees here. Um, you can take that as a share of profits and so on. I think Harry will talk a bit more about fees uh, later on. So just to wrap up, now this is Bo's question. So, you know, this is just, you know, single 13 correlated events on a single day, uh, realized on a single day. What if things had turned out differently? So what if you know, these states had been decided differently? Um, you can do a robustness check by saying, well, you know, looking at the hypotheticals and you know, the three states that were closest, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, um, if any one of them had flipped, uh, you'd have made less money, the bot would have made less money, but, uh, and you can see exactly how much there, but it would still have come out ahead. Uh, only if Wisconsin had gone to Trump along with at least one of these other two states would the bot have lost money, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a, a decisive performance uh, uh, evaluation conclusion that we can draw from this. Okay, just to wrap up, um, the overall performance difference between model and market is negligible, but you get interesting patterns in the time series, early versus late. There was a huge inflow, I haven't had time, again, if you wanna look at the paper, it's posted online, uh, the, if you, there was a huge inflow of funds. There were a thousand times as much money in this market at the end of the period compared to the beginning. And a lot of it was what, you know, what we can think of as MAGA money, a lot of heavy bets on Trump, which continued to bet on Trump even after the elections was called. Um, uh, and and that's, you know, that could be causing distortions towards the end. The average beats both components overall and at the end of the period, this I think should be surprising actually. Uh, it's because of different errors in different kinds of states. There's a value of hybridization that this suggests. We construct a possibility, a, a, a method of proposing a hybrid prediction market based on a virtual trader. And uh, um, hopefully, you know, uh, in the future, we'll be able to test this experimentally, try to find a tuning of these parameters in this budget that will improve the forecast uh, um, compared to both model and market. And I'll stop there. I hope I didn't go too much over time, Dave. No, uh, great, thank you. That was perfect. Thank you, Rajiv. Thanks. Excellent. Really, really interesting.
Uh, we have one question from Asa, and I'll read it to you. Um, is your bot solving a dynamic program when deciding how much to bet in each time period, or is it just behaving myopically in the yeah. sense it does not anticipate account for a potential evolution of beliefs over future time periods? Yeah, that's really a great question. No, it's not solving a dynamic program. It's, it's optimizing day by day. And the idea is that the future beliefs are not forecastable. They're martingale. This, is, this issue came up yesterday, actually. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, yeah, I, if, you were, if you were able to predict future beliefs, that should, that should affect your current beliefs. Um, you know, your, your future beliefs ought to be, uh, you know, all information that you have about the future should, or should be incorporated in your current beliefs. So yeah, you're, you're behaving myop myopically, myopically, but I wouldn't characterize it that way because the future beliefs ought to be unforecastable. Yeah. Great. And Harry has a question. He's here on the panel. Yeah, Rajiv, uh, thanks. I just had a couple of questions to clarify. Yeah. So what, uh, I, I think I missed it. What weight did you end up giving in your average? Uh, what weight is put on the model versus what the weight on the market? It's just a simple average. The, 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 the crude uh, uh, average. 50, 50. Yeah, it's just an equal weight. Okay. And uh, when you did your 16% return, was that using this average strategy, this average? No, no, okay. no, no, not at all. No, it, with the 16% return, it's using the, the objective function that I, that I, I, so you're maximizing expected utility. The utility function we use is log utility. So you're maximizing yeah. the expected okay. value of log terminal wealth subject to your beliefs P that are coming from the model and your budget. But of course your budget is changing from period to period. You're making money along the way actually. Mm -hmm. um, or losing money. Uh, you know, you're buying and selling securities along the way. You saw Wisconsin, you go up and down. You're, you're, you're selling securities that you hold. And this is affecting your, your, your cash position and your contract holdings. And you're continuously optimizing, not continuously, but daily, re-optimizing your portfolio. And your yeah. model probabilities for that are from what model? The economist model, the, the, the Gelman, yeah, okay. Vitamins, yeah, yeah, okay. Vitamins, Gelman and Morris model, the, the, the published probabilities. Exactly, okay. exactly. That's helpful. So did you try that for the 538 or you, you didn't? No, so, no, we didn't try it for 538, but, but actually for 538, what we are planning to do uh, is, is to use the full property distribution because they, they had the simulations, 40,000 simulations, and you can actually have the distribution. So Andrew Gelman has a very, very interesting blog post on negative correlations in the 538 okay. forecast, which means, you know, because Mississippi and Oregon negatively correlated, which is really weird, I have to tell you. But it means that, you know, if the market price in Oregon changes, you're going to take a very odd kind of bet in, 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 in Mississippi. If, if, mm -hmm. if, if you believe Oregon's more likely, you're going to actually bet against Biden, uh, you know, and, and, and so we want to test that out. And we've got that data for one day. You know, I don't have the time series data from 538 for, you know, for, for that full simulation, 40,000. Uh, we'll try to get it, but but I know you're going to talk about 538, so I'm looking forward to that. Right, yeah. So I just wanted to get all my facts straight. So yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you again, Rajiv.